Hi everybody, welcome back to Left Foot Media. My name is Brendan Malone, and in this video I want to take you back to the time before. The time before Marvel tried to drown us all in a tsunami of spandex wearers and multiverses. The time before Hollywood had humiliated itself by willingly becoming the sock puppet for progressive political ideology. And quite frankly, I think that's putting it mildly and charitably. The time before 9-11 the Iraq War and the unhinged rantings of the now-defunct New Atheists held sway in the public square. The time before the cuckolded Will Smith was engaging in violent humiliation rituals with other men at public awards ceremonies. Maestro, trumpets please, if you will. Today I want to take you back to the year of our Lord 2000, which is four years of our Lords before Jim Caviezel would play our Lord in the Passion of the Christ, in the year of our Lord, 2004. Before all of that, back in 2000, he played the lead role in a glorious little cinematic story about family and time travel called Frequency. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, Brendan, you are ripe now in this moment of your script to make a joke about the band Rem and that song that they sang, What's the Frequency, Kenneth? Because everyone knows Rem and they love that song by Rem called What's the Frequency, Kenneth? And this is a movie called Frequency, so you should use that song by Rem. Sorry, hold on a minute. What? No, no, it's spelt R-E-M, but it is pronounced Rem. Everyone knows that. The band's name is Rem. Who told you it was R-E-M? You should do some Google and research or something. Because that, no, that, look, no, I'm telling you, it's not pronounced REM. Next, you'll be trying to tell me that Kifka is pronounced KFC. It's not. It's Kifka. Everyone knows that. But you've ruined it now. The moment's gone. They came here for a bit of hilarity and a bit of banter, me and them. But, you know, you gone and ruined it. So thank you for that. Roll tape. <laughs> Now, before we go any further in this video, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. And if you haven't already done so, please give this video a little like. Click on that thumbs up button. It really, really helps the channel if you do that. Now, this obviously goes without saying. There's going to be plenty of spoiler talk today. So if you haven't already seen the film Frequency and you don't want anything spoiled, now is the time to shut off this video, go away, watch Frequency, and then come back later. If you're still here, you have been warned. Frequency, released in the year 2000, is a science fiction thriller which tells the story of a police officer named John Sullivan, played by Jim Caviezel, and his dead father and former New York veteran firefighter Frank Sullivan, played by Dennis Quaid. Thanks to a rare astronomical anomaly on the 30th anniversary of his father's tragic death in a warehouse fire, John discovers that he is able to communicate back through time with his long-deceased father, using his old ham radio set. This mysterious connection allows the two men to work together in both the past and the present to change the shape of historical events and hunt down a serial killer who has been getting away with murder for decades. The film also stars a very young Michael Cera in his first ever feature film appearance, playing the role of Gordy Jr., the young son of John Sullivan's lifelong best friend, Gordo Sr. So, where to start when talking about frequency? Well, this film has a 7.4 rating at the time of recording on the Internet Movie Database and an 81% audience score rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And I have to say that this movie absolutely deserves every single bit of it. This has actually, I think, become a bit of a forgotten classic. And when I recently introduced my 15-year-old twin daughters to it for the very first time, they absolutely loved it, and they were raving about it for days afterwards. It's one of those movies that came out of a, I don't know, would you call it a golden period? A period before the politics took over, a period where there was a bit more sort of hope, and a period where even your sort of lower budget films, the things that perhaps didn't get the big cinematic popcorn summer release, 
type, um, you know, uh, what would you call it? the big moments in cinematic history, they were still pretty solid films. You'd go to a video store and you would look for these movies that you hadn't really heard of and you would see these actors who were reasonably competent and reasonably well-known and they were playing roles that actually were meaningful and stories that actually, you know, they were engaging. That, that sort of thing is a bit of a long-lost thing now, sadly, for whatever reason. It's just not that way anymore. And this is one of those movies that came out of that period and it still holds up. 24 years later, this movie is still a really solid and enjoyable film. I watch it probably once a year. It's not a religious thing for me, but I just happen to have it in the collection and it probably gets pulled out once a year. And when I go back and watch it, every time I am still pulled in to the sort of mythic heart of the story. And I'll talk more about that later because that's one of the things that I think I really love about this movie. But it still holds up 24 years later and it absolutely deserves the high audience appreciation and love that it has received. Basically, this is a film that has an excellent premise that is brilliantly executed. So you've got this idea of a father and son where the father is dead and the son is able to communicate with him across time and space. So how are you gonna make that happen? Well, they're gonna communicate with each other via an old ham radio that the father previously owned and now the son has brought out of the storage closet and has turned the power on again to this radio and he's now discovered a portal, a connection with his father. But how does that make sense? They're talking to each other through a radio. That still doesn't quite make sense. Well, you create an astronomical anomaly, a, uh, what would you call it, Aurora Borealis, this uh, rip in the time-space continuum related to this bizarre sort of appearance in the skies at night that is very rare and this becomes like a wormhole, a portal for them to communicate, and it just kind of makes sense. It all just works. It's very simple, really, but it is executed with brilliance, and the premise is just a really solid one. Forget about the DeLorean or a time-traveling phone booth. In this case, you've got two men who are engaging in a type of time travel, but they don't actually leave their own time zone. They engage via you know, time and space and this radio. They communicate with each other. It's a really, really beautiful and simple concept that actually works really, really well. So let me start by giving this film some technical compliments, some things that I like about the technical aspects of the movie. And then I want to move into the storytelling and why I really like that. And then finally finish up by touching on the deeper themes, the mythic themes that lie at the heart of this movie. First of all, there are some great use of Dutch angles in this movie. Often the Dutch angle, I think now, particularly in the era of the comic book movie, or are we in the post-comic book era now? I'm sort of losing track of all of that. But in the comic book era, Dutch angles became a thing that were totally overused. And it's pretty rare now to see a film where they use it sparingly and use it well. And this is a great example of that. There are uses of the Dutch angle which really carry weight and have impact because it's not being overused. When the Dutch angle is used well, it puts you into a sense or a state of unease where like you feel things are a little bit jarring, something's not quite right. But if you overuse it and it's constantly appearing in a film, then all of that is lost. You don't get the impact of it. This film uses it well. There is also some clever use of recurring symbolic imagery in this film, like whenever they have rips or divergence in time, when they have things changing and the timeline is shifting, they use consistent symbolism to show you what's going on. And it's a very, very clever use of that symbolism. I felt the whole idea of things falling and things slowing down and there is a sense of something being broken in those shots. If you're not sure what I'm talking about and you haven't seen the film in a while, go back and watch it again and you will see it. And it's a great little way of connecting your subconscious, your mind, with what's going on. They're not telling you, they're showing you. A great example of show, don't tell, and a great use of symbolism to really enhance the storytelling in this film. There are some very smart uses of plot devices in this movie as well. I'll talk a little bit more about this when I talk about the story, but in reality, this film could have easily collapsed in on itself, and I'll share more of my thoughts on that in a moment. 
but they use plot devices really, really well to actually progress the plot along, to tell you exactly what you need to know and know more. They don't get bogged down. It doesn't ever become cumbersome. It doesn't ever walk itself into a blind alley, into a dead end of any sorts. The plot devices are just used really, really well. And speaking of that, this is one of the best literal examples of Chekhov's gun, also known as Chekhov's rifle, that principle that if a uh, an item appears in a film, it should have meaning. So everything that appears on screen should have some meaning in the plot and should drive things forward. And so if you have a gun that appears in the first act of a film, it should be used at some point in the story. And you actually get this in this movie. And I think it's one of the best examples, like a literal example of Chekhov's gun that you will actually see in a film. There is also some great use of cosmetic aging in this movie. There's no CG in regards to this. We sort of forget this nowadays where everything is done with digital de-aging and anti-aging of characters' faces or aging of a character's face. In this film, they do it the old way with cosmetics and makeup and I guess some prosthetics, but they do it really, really well. And it's not one of those moments where you go, ooh, that's definitely a young woman or a young man hiding behind a whole slather of makeup you actually feel that this is someone who could well have aged. It's, it's a great example of the old school cinematic craft, the time before things collapsed and the studios decided to do this the new way and you saw a bit more of that sort of artisan skill on display and this film has that kind of stuff in spades and that's just one example of it. But my biggest praise, as I alluded to earlier for this film, is actually the storytelling aspects of it. Basically, and in theory, this film shouldn't really work because it should stretch your willing suspension of disbelief to such a degree that it gets to breaking point and you just go, no, this is just nonsense. A father and a son communicating with each other across time and space, across 30 years, and the father's dead and they're using a ham radio to do it. This really should stretch your credulity. It really should stre stretch your willing suspension of disbelief to the point where you go, nah, this is just not believable. And then once the plot starts to unfold as well and they start changing time, that should also, I think, really perhaps break things a little bit as well. But it doesn't. Thanks to some really clever writing, what is a complex plot is woven together in such a seamless way that not only does it all make sense, but not once do you ever find yourself asking, hmm, uh, what's going on here? And that often happens in these types of films where you get time divergence and timelines and changing of time and the past and the future sort of clashing in this way. Like time travel films consistently have this problem where they have to sort of try and explain to the audience what's going on. But this is a great example. It's right up there, I think, with Back to the Future where it just made sense. You always knew what was going on. You were never finding yourself saying, I'm a bit confused now, where are we at? The film just made sense. And that's because the writers have actually put attention to the details and to the actual craft of writing. They've written a film here in a way that is excellent. And so you don't find yourself uh, ever doubting and you don't find yourself ever confused about what's happening. And one way they do this is they just lean into the time changing elements of the plot. It doesn't try to provide convoluted and contorted explanations of how the branching and changing of time works. I think this is one of the interesting and modern phenomena, a problematic phenomena of modern films, is they feel that they have to give you this materialistic, empiricist answer and explanation for that kind of stuff. So if this film was made today, I suspect that what would have happened is someone would have appeared in the film as a science expert to tell us exactly how this all happens. So one of the characters would have probably visited a university professor at his office in the university and and explained what was going on. Like they probably would have been a friend to the character and they would have said, hey, can you explain how this could happen? And then the professor character, their job would be to explain the science of it all to the audience. But this film doesn't do that. And it doesn't need to do that. It doesn't get contorted and convoluted with any explanations. It just says, hey, here are the rules. And it lays down some very clear rules. And then it starts inhabiting that universe where those rules actually play out and affect the characters and their actions. And it just all makes sense. You just go with it. There's no need to explain it. And in fact, I think this is a great example to modern filmmakers. Go back and watch this movie and see how they do it. Establish the rules, 
do it well, and then just get on with the plot. Don't go and try and explain the underpinnings of it all. Don't have deep and mysterious convoluted conversations which actually only bog the plot down and don't really help anything. You don't need to do that. You can just create the rules and then move the story forward in a universe that is shaped by those rules. And as I said, this film, it just establishes those rules and then just jumps into it and you never find yourself questioning at all. And that is a great example of some really, really good storytelling, some good writing. One of the things I really loved about this was the way that Jim Caviezel's character of John is basically the memory keeper. So when time changes, it's only him who is aware that time has actually shifted. He's the only one who has the sense that there are two versions of history that have actually played out. So the former version, which was the only version, and the new changed version, he basically has both. He keeps both uh, within his own being, within his own sense of memory and the world as it is. And in one sense, this kind of doesn't really make sense because why wouldn't other characters have also had past memories and a sense that something has changed and shifted because surely they would be affected by this as well. But in another way, this decision within the plot makes perfect sense. I mean, not just because it doesn't bog the film down in this needless, contorted and sort of convoluted universe now. We don't need to worry about what's going on with the other characters. That would just distract away from this really tightly wound and tightly told story. And so it's not just effective in that regard, but it actually makes sense because the relationship between Jim Caviezel and his father is actually the emotional core of this film. And so it makes perfect sense that he would be the memory keeper. This is his story. This is his journey. This is his memories. This is his time and his perception of time in the world. So it makes perfect sense that only he would be this one who has an awareness that things have actually changed. Because the idea here is that he is the one as our main character, the hero on this hero's journey, who actually holds all of this in being, this world, this story, this sense of what's unfolding. And as I said, the emotional heart of it is the relationship between him and his father. So of course it makes perfect sense that it would be that way. In a nutshell, they get everything right that they need to so that this complex plot never once collapses into madness or ludicrous scenarios which violate the rules established by the film in its opening act. Like I said, they just create the rules and then they put the characters in those rules into that world that is you know, controlled by those rules and they inhabit that world and they just begin moving forward and unfolding the story. It's exactly how you should do it. And the problem is today we don't get a lot of that. Our stories tend to be more convoluted or messy because the commitment to storytelling excellence is not as much as the commitment to political propagandizing is and we're not telling good stories as a result of that. And one of these moments that I really loved in this film was the scene where Frank had to give his son, who is in the future, a prop, a wallet that he has stolen from another character. And John needs this wallet so he can check it for fingerprints and identify the serial killer. But how do you give your son a wallet across time and space? Sure, they're communicating with each other on this ham radio, but they can't hand each other items. So how do you do that? Well, some basic, simple plot devices come into play here. The father wraps up the wallet securely in a plastic bag, and then he hides it under a floorboard in a particular part of the house. And so the son is able to go to that same spot, open up the floorboard all those decades later, and there, lo and behold, is the wallet that he needs, and he can go and check it for fingerprints. It's a great but very simple little plot device, and it works really well. And I love the way this universe is constructed to sort of just create moments like that. It works really, really well. I also loved how they put time and effort into creating plausibility in all of this. Like if they had just jumped straight into this concept of a father and a son talking across time and space to each other via an old ham radio and both characters had just said, oh yeah, this is believable, and then just jumped into that world, it actually wouldn't have been particularly believable for us. They, they initially build up that trust between the father and the son. They are both skeptical initially, which is exactly what you would be in this moment. They are frightened by this. They think someone else is playing a prank on them. But in actual fact, the way they build it up, you have no problem accepting that these two men 
would actually come to believe what actually really is a bizarre predicament they find themselves caught up in, that they actually realize, no, this is real. And so they give themselves over to it. Now, if they'd rushed that bit, it wouldn't have actually worked at all. Not just that, but I think if they'd made a mess of that little opening salvo, that introduction where you build up the plausibility of what's going on between the father and the son and the fact that they can communicate across time and space via this radio, if they'd stuffed that up, then I think the whole film would have collapsed in that moment. If they'd rushed it and you'd found yourself sitting there going, now this is just not believable, people wouldn't act in this way, why would they believe that this was real? Why wouldn't they first think it was a prank or that someone was lying to them or whatever the case may be? And they hadn't built that up with these little moments of plausibility, these little plot devices that make it all make sense, then the whole film would have collapsed at that point. And you wouldn't have accepted anything else after that. You would have always been stuck, even if only subconsciously in that first moment and gone, yeah, this just doesn't make sense. And that would have coloured and jaundiced the rest of the story for you. And you just wouldn't have gone along on that journey with them. But they do it well. And, and as I said, this is a great example of good storytelling, the kind of storytelling that we are bereft of these days. This film has it in spades. The other thing that is, I think, really noteworthy about this story, and this really, I think, does come from a time before, is the fact that the film manages to strike this perfect balance between grappling with some pretty serious and dark subject matter and also not sort of allowing that to bog the film down in darkness and despair. Like, it's not just the premature death of his father, but also a serial killer called the Nightingale who has been targeting and murdering vulnerable young women for decades. This thing has some pretty dark subject matter. And this film very easily, as a result of that, could have fallen into nihilism and despair, but it never even comes close to that. This is not like, say, for example, the butterfly effect, which really did fall into nihilism. And if you watch the director's cut version of that, the ending is just dark and awful. It's just satanic. You have this character who kills himself with the umbilical cord in the womb before he can even be born because his life and his existence is such a dark nihilistic thing in the world. It's just awful. This film could have fallen into that sort of nihilism, but it doesn't. And in many ways, like I said, this is a film that is very much the fruit of a more confident and hopeful American culture. This film is not one that is marred by cynicism, despair, and ugly political warfare. This is a movie that was released at the end of the 90s, which was a really strong decade for America. Probably one of their best, I think, in all of their history, in fact, a lot of historians would tend to say. And it also is made months before 9-11 happens and changed everything for America and the West. And so I think there is more of a sense of the hopefulness there is sort of mythic storytelling that is focused on goodness and truth and beauty in this film that is often missing today because we are just too marred by either a loss of sacred hope, we don't have a sacred transcendent horizon in our Christian faith that we look to anymore, we've rejected or abandoned or lost sight of that by and large as a Western culture and so our storytelling suffers as a result. We're just cynical and despairing and our artists, they don't know where to go for hope so they don't really put a lot of hope into their films. And when they are trying to insert hope, it's kind of a false hope. It's politics. It's about political revolution and changing the world through Marxist identity-driven politics and things like that. And, and this film is not that at all. It, it's much deeper and more primal. It is mythic in the way that it tells its story. And I think, as I said, that's a reflection of a, a time before a lot changed in the West over the last 24 years years or so since that movie was released. Which brings me to what I think is another one of the big strengths about this film. There are zero politics in this movie. Constantly today we are bombarded by the propagandistic bully pulpit, but not this film. Instead this film, and gosh it is refreshing not to be bombarded by all of the current political obsessions and power games. Instead this movie focuses solely on the universal and timeless elements of great mythical storytelling and it really has those things in spade and like I said it's just so refreshing to have a film that focuses on things like good versus evil. The hero's journey, father and son engaged in a noble quest to save the damsels in distress, suffering, loss and redemption most importantly of all, a really hopeful redemption in this film. The idea that good can win 
that through suffering and commitment to virtue, we can actually make the world a better place. The fact that there are powerful forces of darkness who are waging a war against goodness and truth and the family, which is the central premise of this particular film, across the expanses of time and space. There are real evil forces that really are trying to destroy the family and society, and this film speaks to that in a very mythic and symbolic and beautiful way. The stakes are real and there is meaningful drama as a result. Like I said, I watch this film probably around once a year and I still get caught up in the drama of it every time, even though I know the story backwards and forwards, inside and out, and I know exactly what's going to happen. That is the hallmark of good storytelling, when you can be caught up into the drama. There are great characters here, there's a great story, there's something more mythic at play, and that's why it's not just so universal, but it is so consistent. You can keep going back to it, it's timeless. And that's why this film still holds up. That's why when I played this film for my 15-year-old daughters just the other day, they loved it and they found something meaningful in it for themselves because it is timeless and it is universal. Which brings me to the most important part of this video, the deeper themes that I see in the heart of the story in the movie Frequency. One of the major and important themes, as I've already alluded to just a few moments ago, is actually family, and specifically the love between a father and his son. It's actually quite refreshing and beautiful to see an authentic depiction of fatherhood and masculinity between a dad and his boy that is not cliched, it's not cynical, and it's not perverted by the degeneracy of Marxist ideological loathing and envy. It's just a really beautiful and hope-filled and inspiring depiction, a universal and mythic depiction of the love between a father and a son, how the world is actually supposed to be. Dads are supposed to love their boys in this way. Boys are supposed to look up to and love their dads in this way. And there is supposed to be a shifting of time that happens. When you are younger, your dad is the one who cares for you and nurtures you. When you become older, you then nurture and care for and save your father. It's just, it's very beautiful. And it is the kind of thing we don't see much of anymore. Like I said, these kinds of things today are either non-existent or they, if they do appear, perhaps they can be a little bit too cliched. There is an artistic depth that's often missing, or more often than not, they become cynical perversions because of the degeneracy of Marxist ideological loathing and envy. They can't stand the relational world, the relational world built on goodness and truth between persons, this Christian vision of reality where everything is relational. I have a relationship first and foremost with God, and then I have a relationship with my neighbor, and then I have a relationship with the created order. But that's not how the Marxists look at the world. Instead, they see everything as just blind matter in motion, and they reduce everything to pure power struggle. It's about who's got power and who doesn't have power, and that corrupts everything. But this film goes back to the relational, and it shows you what can be and what the beautiful possibilities are when we put a dedication and a commitment to virtue, and the most important of all being self-giving love, at the heart of our relationships, and in particular this relationship between father and son. They actually go on a hero's journey together. Like I said, they get to save the damsels in distress. This thing that saves the world is this bond, this familial relationship between a dad and his boy, and that's a beautiful thing. And of course, this also branches out into a depiction of community. There is a bigger community here. It's not just the father and the son, but they are part of a wider community. And although it's not a major emphasis in the film, it is there at key moments. You know that these people's lives are shaped by community and by an authentic community. They live local, they live uh, real life with real people in the real world. But the big theme that I see in this film, and it's one that I think can be easily missed on an initial viewing, but it really is, I think, the central premise here, is this idea that every human life is actually sacred. It is so profoundly valuable because it has meaningful impact on the world around it. And something is missing, something is lost when that life is lost. In many ways, I think this is a slightly different retelling of that Frank Capra classic, it's a Wonderful Life, which is about George Bailey, played by Jimmy Stewart, this guy who has some bad experiences, and as a result of that, he thinks that his life is meaningless, and so he is standing on a bridge contemplating suicide, 
when a bit of a clumsy angel is sent down to convince him that his life does have meaning. It's a Wonderful Life was a film that, when it was first released, was actually a bit of a box office flop. It didn't do well at the movies at all. This seems to be a bit of a trend that often happens with some of the greats, like, for example, Shawshank Redemption had the same experience. It was a bit of a flop at the box office, but then when it came to home video, people discovered that this was this profound and beautiful and truly amazing film, and it became a classic after that. Well, It's a Wonderful Life had a similar sort of trajectory, and what happened was, after it starts getting broadcast on TV and people are watching it at home, they discover that this is actually a phenomenal film. It's one of Frank Capra's best, and it's one of the best films that's ever been made. It really is a classic. If you're looking for something to watch at Christmas this year, this is a great movie for a family to sit down and enjoy together. And what lies at the heart of that film, as I said, is that sense that every life has profound meaning. This angel actually shows George Bailey that hey, you're saying right now that the world would be better off without you? Well, let me show you exactly what would happen if you had never been born. Here's how the world would have been worse off if you weren't in it. And that really, I think, is a central aspect of frequency as well. It's showing us the impact, in this case, the life of his father and the loss of his father and the way that that loss of his father has actually shaped his life for the worse and how recovering the father in his life and recovering the love between him and his father and rebuilding that relationship and saving his life and bringing him back into his world actually makes his world better in lots of different ways. And it's not just his world though, it's the world of all of these other characters that we don't see in the movie. The woman who was saved by the earlier capture of the Nightingale serial killer. The world is made better by your life. The whole world is affected in profound ways and there are these beautiful branches and sometimes they come from suffering and tragedy and hardship and even people who live lives that aren't so good and perhaps do harm in their wake, there is still a profound impact there and I think we sort of understate all of that at our peril and this film I think speaks to that and reminds us of that, that sense of sacred wonder that we should have about every human life. And what this film does, I think, is that it develops this idea of interconnection of human relationships and the value and profound world-changing impact that not just individuals have, but the way in which each and every life interacting with each and every other life has profound impact. Like I said, this is a slightly different variation of the mythic theme that we find at the heart of It's a Wonderful Life. And so it seems like it could be quite appropriate to end this little review by leaving you with a quote from Clarence Oddbody, the angel in It's a Wonderful Life, when he says, Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? And that is really the central and deep theme that I see in this movie, Frequency. So I'm going to give this one a 9 out of 10. It's not quite right up there with the best of the best, but gosh, it's a phenomenal and well-told story. It's engaging. It holds its own still 24 years later. It is not bogged down by politics. The commitment to storytelling is great. It's simple, but it does the things that it needs to well. And so you have a really beautiful, engaging and enjoyable movie experience. This is what movies should be. This is the potential, the mythic that can be relayed through the cinematic. And this film has that in spades. So I highly recommend it. It's a great family film, probably more for older children if you haven't seen it already. Just some of the subject matter is not really going to play so well with younger kids, definitely for older kids. But absolutely, this is a film, if you've got a family with older kids, or you've got older kids in your family, you could sit down together, mum and dad and the family, and you can enjoy this movie with them. Thanks again for tuning in. Don't forget, if you want to support the work that I do, you can go to patreon.com forward slash leftfootmedia and become a regular patron with any amount at all. But if you become a $5 monthly patron, you will get access to an exclusive Monday to Friday episode of the Dispatches audio podcast. I do a daily podcast Monday through Friday, which provides conservative commentary on current affairs and political issues. So if that interests you, become a $5 monthly patron. Otherwise, you can contribute any amount that you want to at all. All of it really, really helps to produce more of this video content. And as I have pledged to my patrons a few weeks ago, 
this is the first of my new monthly videos. I've reshuffled my schedule so that every month moving forward there will be a brand new video for you to enjoy and maybe some months, like this month, there will actually be more than one video for you to enjoy. But your support really, really helps. If you don't want to do that, and by the way, the link is in the show notes for the Patreon page, you can support me in other simple ways by becoming a subscriber to the channel and by clicking like, giving this video a thumbs up. That really, really helps the show. Thanks to all of our patrons. It's thanks to you that this content is made possible. Thanks again for tuning in. And don't forget, live by goodness, truth and beauty, not by lies. And I'll see you next time on Left Foot Media.